Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are so happy to be here sharing our Wednesday afternoon with you guys. Yes, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Tuning in. And as you, I see some folks are joining us. So just to get an idea of who is out there, uh, we're going to publish a little poll to see what best defines your role if you're a librarian, a teacher, or other. Uh, so let us know. And then in the chat box, please let us know where you're logging in from. We'd love to hear, you know, where folks are are at home right now. So I'm in Atlanta, and uh, Isma is in uh, Connecticut. I'm in Connecticut. <laughs> And we have a wonderful presentation that we prepared for you guys today with like some videos and some um, uh, file handouts that we're going to give out. But if uh, please, we'd love to answer questions as the presentation goes. We don't want to leave questions for the end. So please feel free to dump your questions in the chat and we will answer them as we see them. OK, and we have oh, 25 percent librarians, 50 percent teachers, 25 percent other would love to know what the other is. So if you want to put that uh, in the uh, in the in the chat box, that would be awesome. So let's get started. We have a lot of stuff to cover uh, today and we want to start with why uh, diversity in kid lit matters. And we want to use um, this analogy, which you guys have probably heard of. Uh, that representation is like a window, like a mirror, and like a sliding door. And we actually yeah. have that beautiful quote here for you guys. And Isma, do you want to walk us through it? Sure, I'll jump in. So I don't know about you guys, but I, I remember I had heard this phrase that books are like windows, mirrors, and doors a bunch of times before I actually tracked it down to figure out, well, who who said this first and where did it come from? So books are sometimes windows offering views of worlds that may be real or imagined, familiar or strange. These windows are also sliding glass doors and readers have only to walk through them in imagination to become part of whatever world has been created and recreated by the author. And then when lighting conditions are just right, a window can also be a mirror so the reader can see themselves in the mirror. So this is by Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop, amazing literary scholar, we've all, again, heard this really good analogy. So this explains a little bit about why it is important to have a diverse book collection so that you can make sure that you're reaching all and serving all of your uh, your audience, all of your community. And it, it's just, especially for um, marginalized, historically marginalized communities, it just becomes so important. Like, for example, for me, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. Uh, I moved to the States where when I was uh, 22. So, but I know my nieces and my nephews uh, are now growing up in the States because they're part of a military family. So it's so important for them to see themselves as the heroes of their own story, to know that um, they have the power basically to achieve whatever they want. And it just has uh, seen themselves in, in books, seeing themselves represented represented in a story it's just it's such um it's it's empowering it's 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 an mm -hmm. active thing it's not it's not a passive thing we know that uh reading fiction in particular has like incredible effects on the brain we know it increases as many studies have been done and actually uh I, i'm a producer at cnn and a few months ago when we were still going out i had the opportunity to interview a uh, professor in Yale that does research with, has done research without fiction. And she was telling me like, I mean, it's it's amazing when you look at the effects of fiction in the brain, it increases empathy. It helps us look at the world from somebody else's perspective. It helps, mm -hmm. it helps us almost, um, uh, we can uh, practice what we want to do our own lives right we, we we can we can have this little like practice mode place where we can see ourselves doing these things so for kids that um one that are vulnerable and two that are in a, in a place in their lives where somebody who the person who gives the book to them can have such a big influence later down the road i mean it's so important to 
have it really is uh, a, a collection of that that has this diversity. Oh, hi, Aileen is here. So if you're just joining us, please use the chat to communicate. We'd love to hear from you. We love to have your questions. Please let us know where you're logging in from. And if you have any comments, suggestions, questions, things that have worked for you in the past, we'd love to hear those as well. Uh, and let's move on to the next slide. Uh, so let's talk about uh, learning diversity through books. Uh, Isma, do you want to walk us through this one? Sure. And, you know, I'll go back to um, something that we had wanted to talk about before we even started is just a huge disclaimer. So we're not necessarily the experts on all diverse books in the entire world and exactly what to do for your library or your collection. We're just just like everybody. We're learning along the way. And this talk was actually um, I had the good fortune to deliver a talk very similar to this in 2018 to a group of writers and SCBWY in uh, the New Jersey, a New Jersey conference. And that was sort of my starting point, my learning point. That's when I went back and I was sort of researching the original sources um, and looking at the research that Myra even mentioned, like, well, what is it that we know scientifically that books do for kids, both the good and the bad? So we've condensed a lot of the information to make this an easier bite to swallow for everybody. But I do have, I, I had made that presentation in a different platform called Prezi, and it's very long and very exhaustive. And I did make it into a PDF file, which we will yes, offer you as a hands out. Oh, great. If you, if you want it, so, if you're interested in, in it, but this is a, this is a much more user friendly, especially via virtual webinar <laughs> format that Myra was excellent to, to do. She was like, this is really very comprehensive. <laughs> So, so I, I just um, shared with you guys two files. One is Isma's press, Prezi uh, presentation, uh, like which has a ton of information. It's a, it's, it's awesome. And the other one is a handout that we have prepared for you. And in that handout, you will find the links that are in that presentation. So basically, all the links that we use to find and compile this information. For example, if you're trying to convince uh, your uh, libraries to you know increase your collection you may be able to find some important research in in those links and uh, one of the member of members of Las Musas which is uh, a Latina authors collective uh, you can go to lasmusasbooks.com uh, to find out um, everything that we do she put together she's also a, a teacher and she put together a list of 300 uh diverse books that it's just an amazing list and mm -hmm. they're categorized by like graphic novels middle grade ya picture books and we included that in the handout as well and i'm sharing but that way you guys so you can download on your, on your end. yeah but all of these lists and these sources are not exhaustive and also the sources changed so i i went back and i was re-researching all of these things and i also it was interesting i found that a lot of the original source not a lot some of the original sources in the blogs that I'd found back in 2018 are no longer working. Or I noticed that nothing else had been published to that blog since that time. Yeah. And so this is an evolving field and we encourage you to have a dialogue about it. So if you think of yeah. something or you know some good titles that you wanna share with the group, please put it in the chat. Yes, so put it in the chat. This, is a, this is a little bit of about the research. So again, it's this idea of, um, uh, windows, mirrors, and doors. So from the point of view of a of the window, it's, you know, the book allows a reader to get a window into the life of somebody who is different from them. And this, it could be different from them on many different aspects of diversity. We'll get to all the different bits of diversity a little bit later. But this is important for building empathy. And it's also important um, because, to do it early because a lot of the research has shown that, for instance, there has been a lot of research done on race perceptions in children, and a lot of, especially white parents, are concerned about discussing race with their children when they're young. And they wait to have these discussions until their children are more mature. And the research has shown that actually, when they're much younger is the time to do it. So this is why where picture books come in, why it's really important to show characters from with lots of representing lots of different types of people and ability levels, even in picture books, because we need to get to the kids when they're when they're young. And it's this yeah, idea that, 
Go ahead. One of the studies that you and I discussed, the um, basically kids had already formed an opinion by the first grade. So by the third grade, it was already too late. Right. And, you know, these opinions are opinions that they gather just from their daily life, you know, mm -hmm. playground interactions, watching their parents going to the grocery store. And so especially if they're living in an area where there isn't a lot of diversity, it's important to expose them to diversity when they're young. And books are, and, you know, a, a good substitute for real life experience, especially now in, yes. in, the, in these COVID situations. So again, it gets it allows kids to you know meet characters from different backgrounds, and in some ways, it's it's again it's it's not a it's always better if they can do this in person, but that's not always possible. Mm -hmm. um, we discussed uh, how books can introduce conversations about race and also other um, ability levels or different religions, and um, how fiction definitely can increase your empathy because then. You know, it basically reduces this idea of the stereotype and opens mm -hmm. you to the understanding that people are individuals and that you have to get to know a person on an individual level to really understand them. Everyone has a story. And we have a video that we want to share. Uh, it's this, a video that Source Books put together. It's called Why I Read. It's only two minutes. That's really short. I, I like to read endlessly. Like, I don't, I don't like to stop. My mom came in the room one day and she was like, oh, you don't read? I was like, yeah, there's this teacher, Ms. Dickerson, and she was like, oh, the teacher that, that you didn't like a couple weeks ago? And I was like, yeah, she gave me this book, and I actually loved the book. I was like, I hate reading, this is stupid. Later I just discovered that that book just wasn't for me and that there were books out there that are for me. If you just read because you have to read, it's no fun. When I read for fun, there's no pressure. I could read a page tomorrow and 30 the next. I don't know why people don't like reading if they can get the things that they want. They're interested in everything. In education, it, it, it's like a powerful thing to have. I want to try to challenge myself and learn new words and bigger words. I really like the word gigantic for some reason. If you don't like reading, you're missing out all the fun. I read whenever I can. I read in the car. I'm not supposed to because supposedly it fix your eyes. But I eat a lot of carrots, so that that's my justification. My friends call it reading mode, so they won't talk to me because they know I'd be distracted and they'd have to be like, Lydia, stop. <laughs> Every book I read, I like more than the last one. When you read something, like, you feel the emotion, it's like, <gasps> oh. Reading makes me happy because I can, um, I can learn, learn more about stuff and, and think about maybe if I want to do that or not. It has different aspects of life while it has also unreal things, unreality. They're not exactly talking to me, but I can, I'm like there still. When I read the book and the person is able to like conquer all the hindrances and things that that's happening, I feel I can also do it. It helps me make the right choice. I've had friends who, after they started reading, like they actually realized like, hey, like the streets ain't for me. When people expect things from you, they don't expect nothing else. People never expected me to pick up a book and read, and I actually did it. I knew I could do college after I started reading. I just think it's cool. Yay, I love that video. It always like makes me tear up a little. <laughs> oh, you're muted. I'm Sorry. Muted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I muted it so I wouldn't uh, interfere with the audio. Okay, so let's continue with our wonderful presentation. Oh, that's so, great. I love it. So, but the handouts should be under files. You should be able to click um, a link to the files and download the handouts. So there's one that's a very large PDF, which is just the Prezi presentation. It's not the, it's just a PDF of the presentation. But then there's a handout that actually has the links in it. So you can just click the link and it'll take you to the video so you can. If Share it with all your on, other um, book lovers. On the right side of your screen, you should be seeing where uh, a hand, little handouts section. And then if you click on that, you can download them. If you have any trouble download them, uh, we'll send our contact information at the end of the presentation and you can just reach out to us. So let's talk real quick about types of diversity. So, you know, normally when we think of diversity, we think of, you know, the things that everyone talks about, skin color, uh, sexual orientation, uh, those are kind of like um, the most uh, 
yeah, the most talked about uh, types of diversity, but there's just so much more. Uh, for example, I am, um, I am Latina. I'm also a woman. So I'm, you know, I got two minority strikes and I'm also Buddhist. So I, if I want to find a book with a Buddhist, Latina, Puerto Rican girl protagonist, I'm probably going to have to write it myself because <laughs> I haven't <laughs> seen it. I haven't seen it out there. So there's, there's so, you know, people are so complex. Um, Jen, oh, Jennifer, I see your message. Don't worry. We will, I'm, I'm, we're going to, I'm going to send you uh, my contact information at the end and then we'll, we'll make sure you get the document. Um, so, you know, let's go over some of the types of diversity. And if you guys think of anything else that is not on this list, please put it on the chat box. So, you know, we talk about race, uh, physical characteristics like bone structure, skin, hair, eye color, uh, ethnicity, which are cultural factors like nationality, um, regional culture, ancestry, and language. I mean, and this is, of course, all very, very subjective. Uh, I'll, I'll let you do the next one. Yeah, let Go me ahead. just jump in quickly about um, about race and ethnicity. I I've always understood it from doing medical research. So I've been NIH funded. I enroll subjects in clinical trials, and the NIH appropriately requires you to record the race and ethnicity of every single uh, subject because they want to make sure that you're not excluding anybody and that your results are not going to be biased. Now, the way that it works though is that this all has to be self-reported. And it's very similar to what we see with the US Census. So race options are things like African-American, white, Asian, Pacific Islander, Native American, and ethnicity options are Hispanic, yes or no. So that's one thing that sometimes people, I think, uh, use the term Hispanic for a race. It's actually not a race, it's an ethnicity. Mm -hmm. just, just for clarification, not that I, I really care about the semantics, but if you're reading the research, that's how it's approached. Now, um, sex, gender, and sexual orientation. Sex is, you know, we say a doctor will sex a baby. Like I do that, I do fetal echoes. So I look at the genitalia on the ultrasound and I see, you know, what is the genitalia? Is it a boy or a girl? That's sort of what your body looks like based on your genitalia. Your gender, on, in contrast, is who you yourself feel yourself to be. So gender can can not can be discordant. It doesn't have to be the same as your sex. Those are people. Those people are called referred to as transgender. And then sexual orientation is who you are attracted to sexually. So those are three things that I think are important, especially for educators to understand the difference between. And you guys are probably knew that already, but we have it right there in case you need to teach it to somebody else who doesn't know it. Yes, and ability is another big one. I mean, there's such a small number of books that uh in 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 kitlet that represent uh, ability especially physical mental psychological and neurodiverse even the neurodiverse category has like five other things within it and yeah we could do so a presentation just on, on this topic alone but neurodiverse is becoming much more popular because it includes categories such as autistic spectrum disorder attention deficit disorder dyslexia dyspraxia things that many educators understand and deal with. And so it's it's really important that we see that represented in our literature, not just for students who have these conditions, but for other students who maybe might not understand them. And the best way for them to understand that is through fiction, through, through reading the story of somebody who had this or has this. Um, I, I do think that things are getting better, especially with um, a different ability levels and ableism. I, I personally am seeing a lot more books coming out with kids who are cancer survivors or have autistic spectrum disorder. And I, I find that very re refreshing personally as a mother of a, of a child with ADD. Yeah, and then, so. you know, the other categories, religion, class, and age. Uh, I love the comment that Chris made. She said, uh, sorry, I don't want to assume he or she. Chris uh, said, Matt de la Peña talks about socioeconomic diversity when he read his uh, new beta Newberry title, The Last Stop on Market Street. I love that. That's a great example of uh, socioeconomic uh, diversity. Yeah, the class, right? That was sort of our... Yes, and if you guys have that. some uh, examples of uh, books that tackle, you know, that beautifully tackle one of these diverse topics, please put it on the chat box so everybody else can jump in and, uh, and see it. 
Okay, so let's talk about white privilege because yeah, so white this woman is and amazing. Yeah, go ahead, Ismael, because you're more familiar so, with her. So I was uh, so again when I was researching this original, uh, this original presentation back in 2018, I stumbled upon uh, Peggy McIntosh. And now I, I would not recommend watching her TED Talks because she's not, <laughs> a very, she's not a very dynamic speaker, but she's very, very smart. And what she did, so she was a professor at a university and she was, her focus was women's studies. And she found that it was very difficult for her to communicate to her, her all of her male colleagues, uh, white male privilege, like just the difference between male and female privilege. They couldn't see it. They didn't understand. They said, well, you know, you're here. We don't understand. How is this different? And so what she did to make them understand is she looked at, she looked at differences by race at first. And then she, so she has a lot of literature looking at the differences in, in race and with questions like I can, I, am I able to go to a store and shop without feeling that somebody is following me because they think that I am going to shoplift something? Or can can I live in a society and feel that my children will not be targeted by police officers? Things like this that are very specific to race. But she actually got into it because she was looking for a way to make um, the difference between men and women more understood. And so she talks about this invisible knapsack. So it's this idea that, you know, when she was growing and, and through her research, she understood herself more. She admits that, you know, I never thought of myself as a racist because I just didn't. But then I realized that, you know what, it's just the whole society. I grew up under a structure where my society gives privilege to me because I am white. And so if I'm not aware of that, shame on me. Sort of. So she talks about oh, this, these invisible and, systems that you have to be aware of in terms of conferring advantage to some groups over another. Well, I mean, a society also where white is the norm, where white is considered right. normal, and then everything else is considered other. And you know, as a as a as a member of a marginalized community, this is something that you know we have we struggle all the time, and we're going to talk about this. Um, uh, in the next in the coming minutes we have a session where we we're going to bring some awareness to all of these topics and how to look at books from this perspective but right now we want to share a video with you guys that is i love this video because it it really um shows what w the effect of privilege on on young kids <laughs> I once saw a high school teacher lead a simple, powerful exercise to teach his class about privilege and social mobility. He started by giving each student a scrap piece of paper and asked them to crumple it up. Then he moved the recycling bin to the front of the room. He said, the game is simple. You all represent the country's population, and everyone in the country has a chance to become wealthy and move into the upper class. To move into the upper class, all you must do is throw your wadded up paper into the bin while sitting in your seat. The students in the back of the room immediately piped up saying, This is unfair! They could see the rows of students in front of them had a much better chance. Everyone took their shots and, as expected, most of the students in the front made it, but not all, and only a few students in the back of the room made it. He concluded by saying, The closer you were to the recycling bin, the better your odds. This is what privilege looks like. Did you notice how the only ones who complained about fairness were in the back of the room? By contrast, people in the front of the room were less likely to be aware of the privilege they were born into. All they can see is 10 feet between them and their goal. Your job, as students who are receiving an education, is to be aware of your privilege, and use this particular privilege called education to do your best to achieve great things, all the while advocating for those in the rows behind you. Oh, I love that video so much. Uh, and Aileen has a great comment. Great books with diversity. Dominicana by Andrew Cruz. Uh, oh, I'm dying to read that book. Uh, Jacqueline Woodson Books and Dakita, uh, Dakita Diaz. Oh, I haven't read Dakita Diaz. I'm going to have to read that. Okay, so let's go back to our presentation. Uh, and let's talk about the danger of the single story. And if you, if you guys haven't watched 
this TED Talk by uh, Chimamanda Nyosi Adichie. Please, after we're done with this presentation, this go to YouTube. Right. She is dynamic. It. <laughs> it is it's amazing. It is absolutely amazing. Like, I have listened to her TED Talk about five times, and every time I listen to it, I, I just get goosebumps. She's just, it's just such a, the perfect example of how story defines us and how story, um, those in power get to tell many stories while underrepresented communities get to tell a very small amount of stories. So meaning that we don't, you don't get to show us through story. It doesn't show like how complex we are. For example, uh, in the United States, when, you know, you, you, a lot of people, when they think of Mexicans, they think of immigrants. Uh, they don't think of, you know, college professors who are, you know, Nobel Prize winners or uh, or incredible scientists or politicians or um, authors of all these amazing things. Uh, you know, it's, it's just it, it basically creates stereotypes. You know, they're, they're, it's like um, Chibananda says, the problems with stereotypes, it's, it's not that they're untrue, but they're incomplete. They make one story become the only story. And, you know, when we were preparing for um, this, the webinar, uh, Ismay and I were kind of trading stories from when we were kids. And I was telling her when I was growing up in uh, Puerto Rico, I'm talking, you know, five, six, seven years old. My only experience of Af Africa as a continent and its people was watching World Vision uh, commercials on television in Puerto Rico. That's it. I didn't know anyone who came from any African country. I never uh, read about them uh, in books. Uh, yes, uh, Afro-Caribbean, but not uh, from the African continent. So that was that was my one story. Like for me, I thought of uh, people in Africa and I thought of little starving kids and flies like that, that. Like that's it. Uh, and, you know, as, as I grew and as I expanded my stories, I realized, OK, that's that's not true. That's not the only story. But it, it really we have to look within ourselves and see where where are our only our one story. Right. Like where are we not uh, seeing the full spectrum of humanity? Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. Chris says, Jacqueline Woodson's tech talk, what reading slowly taught her about writing. Oh, I'm going to have to watch that one. I haven't I haven't watched that tech talk. OK, so let's talk about diversity in children's books. And this is why it's so important for uh, classrooms and libraries to have uh, a, a large collection of diverse books, because in reality, the publishing industry just has not caught up. So about 50% of books out there uh, in, in kids books, and this hasn't changed much between 2017, 2018. The 2019 numbers aren't out right now, but I don't expect them to, the change to be that significant. Uh, so about 50% of, uh, of kids books published, and this inclu includes picture books, middle grade, young adult, have a white character in them main character uh, a main character exactly and you know for me i'm latina and so is ismay you know five percent of kids books represent a latina character but here's the catch out of those five percent total number of books only 34 percent were actually written and illustrated by latina and latino authors and illustrators so it would be great if uh, all of these books in this graphic were all written or illustrated by the um, uh, by the ethnicity that they represent, but that is that's not the case. Yeah. Uh, so when you're researching, that's another thing to look at when you're researching books to include to your library and classrooms. You know, try to also look who is writing this book. Like, for what perspective are they bringing to the table? Yeah, and I would add that the um, these aren't even the most recent statistics, but the statistics that I found in 2018 
stated that 50% of children in this country between kindergarten and 12th grade, 50% of them are non-white. So that's that's a statistic yeah. to take home that, and that's going to rise. And then yeah. um, the other thing to point out is, so Myra discussed that the number of books that represent uh, sort of the non-white experience are fewer than the white experience, but we're also talking about, it's not just race, it's also these other aspects of diversity, you know, non-Christian, so other religions or non-heterosexual um, perspectives, if we're talking about young adult books. Um, so that's one issue. The other issue is the authors who write these books are authors who represent these different types of diversity getting their foot in the door there, because we know that they're not as represented as the white, as white authors are. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or the nor, you know, the, not just white, just the normal, able, hetero, white, you sort of the standard fallback. And then the other, the other piece of the puzzle is that in general, the publishing industry is run by white uh, men and women, and so that 80%. yeah, people 80%. They're, they're trying. There, there's a lot of effort expended, I think, to change that because we need to have people in positions of in decision-making positions of, you know, what am I going to add to my list so that we can make sure all these different voices are represented. But those are sort of three different tiers to, to be aware of. Uh, but there's, there, in my experience, there's been a lot of discussion about this this past few years. I just became an author in 2017. So the whole time I've been an author, I've been hearing lots of discussion about this. People acknowledge that it's, it's a problem. And within the publishing industry, there is a lot of interest in lifting up authors that represent different aspects of diversity and having them tell their stories. And so it's being, it's being worked on, but there's, and things are getting yeah. better, but there's still a lot, uh, there's still a lot of progress that has to be made. And I saw somebody push the request to speak, um, little hand. So I forgot to disable that because we can't, we have to take all the Q and a through and comments through the chat box because, um, our our platform only allows for two speakers at a time. So if you have a comment or question or suggestion for diverse books, we'd love to hear it. Please put it all in the chat box and we'll we'll answer. I love that there's conversation going on between yeah, you guys. That is awesome. Keep it up. Um, okay, so this kind of just adds a little bit uh, more information of how many books were actually written and illustrated by uh, people of color and for African American, it's 29% of all the that small number of books. Only 29% uh, were uh, written and illustrated by African and African American people. For Latin, Latinx, is 34%. For Asian, is 39%. And with Native um, Americans, is 53%. So. I mean, it's sad that these books are being published, but the opportunities are not being given to the authors that actually have lived through those experiences. And this is this is something that uh, recently uh, came to light with with the whole uh, American Dirt controversy, which I am sure you guys are very familiar with. And you know, this is another thing to keep in mind when we're talking about who is writing the book is that bad representation has a direct negative effect on the groups being represented. So bad representation is probably just as bad as no representation uh, because when we were looking, when we talk about stories being mirrors, then what are we seeing in that mirror when we're looking at ourselves, right? If I only, if I, as a Latina woman, if I only read, books where the latina protagonist is um in a position of where she's being sort of subservient or uh where you know not that there's anything wrong with with these um with this career choices but you know when you're only the maid or when you're only um the the gardener's daughter you or know the when mistress. you're the, or the <laughs> mistress like the hot mistress right yeah. When you are only those things, then it becomes the single story. And that is the danger of that single story. Why can't that Latina, you know, I love that show, this show Beep, if you guys have watched it. 
like it, the last couple of uh, seasons, the president was a Latina woman. And I was like, oh, I love this show. It's so great. And, you know, to be able to see yourself <laughs> in yeah. a role of power. Yeah. So, And go, let's go back just for one second. I, I want to point out that I think for in children's literature, I do think that we need to hold ourselves to a higher standard than adult yes. literature because we're dealing with young minds that are still developing. And so if if they make a mistake or if we make a mistake and we write something or we recommend a book that has that potentially propagates harmful stereotypes mm -hmm. to a child, it's much different than giving that book to an adult who already has a lifetime of experience behind them. Um, and so that's why, especially when I'm speaking with other writers, I think it's really, really important for everybody to do their research. And as, and as educators and librarians who are in the position to recommend books, it's also important to do your research to make sure that you're not, I mean, I think you all know this, you don't want to give an inappropriate book because not only will it, you get a call from a parent who's upset, but you know, more importantly, you don't, you don't want to negatively influence a, a child's growing mind. Okay, so let's talk about uh, seven things to avoid in Kitlet. I'm basically, we're just trying to, uh, you know, talk about ways that you can look at books from uh, a very, just apply critical thinking when it comes to diversity in this book. So, Isma, do you want to start us off? Yes, and I just want to point out that this this checklist was specifically designed for race, So, but you can apply anything to it. You can apply the religion or sexuality or ableism to it as well. Um, so the first one is if there is no alternative representation of the book, if all the characters are, um, you know, are white, or if the only people of color and the only characters of color in the book are sort of the villains. Uh, there was a great quote from a, um, an educator that I have in that Prezi article, and she is a woman of color. And she said when she was growing up reading books, she never, got to see a person of color ever do any of the exciting fun things. They never mm -hmm. saved the day. They never, uh, you know, climbed the mountains and did all the great things that all the white characters did. And so as a child, she felt that, that those exciting, important things weren't for her. And so this is why we and need that, to make sure that. You know, and I love that statement is made because that happened to me with a romantic comedy so I you know on one sense I was very lucky because I grew up in Puerto Rico so I had a ton of access of books where I could see myself I grew up reading uh, Puerto Rican literature which is it's we have a an amazing tradition of poets and writers and uh, novelists and uh, um, just it's just absolutely amazing <laughs> the, the talent in that small island I also had a lot of access of literature coming in from Latin America so I got to see myself yeah. in the books but where I did not get to see myself was in romantic comedies. And it would always drive me crazy. I was just like, okay, when is there's gonna be a romantic comedy where the lead is a, a Latina female who is just, you know, just thriving and doing great. And it's a, she's a woman in her own right, you know? So it was, it was so cool when, um, this novel came out, uh, The Dirty Girls Club. I love that book because all of the protagonists were Latinas. And I'm like, finally, I can see myself. And it really, that was that book. I actually emailed the um, the author when the whole thing with um, American Dirt was coming out just to let her know, hey, your book, I loved your book when I was growing up and it completely changed my perspective. I felt like if, if, if she could do it, I could do it. So yes, that's awesome. And Chris it's, it's has so a good comment here that one of the problems with that, one of the difficulties that school libraries struggle with is limited funds. And so they have a lot of old stories or old books. And yeah, that's, it's, it's a big challenge, but hopefully some of this research can be useful to give to superintendents or give to your library committees to explain why this is so important to, especially to update your collections. Yes, and if you, I, I actually have been um, working on uh, with several donors to donate copies of S Salty Bitter Sweet to Title I schools and libraries. So if you have a library or a classroom or a classroom that is struggling with funds, please reach out through my website. And I, I have about, right now I have about 15 copies uh, that are available that uh, to mail us. I'll be more than happy to mail you a copy so you can include it to your collection. 
Uh, so let's let's get moving here in the list. We got the seven things to avoid. So white is good, black is evil. It's basically when the color white in the story is associated with everything good and the color black uh, is with everything evil and sin. So we know this a lot in fantasies, right? The, the white witch and the black witch, you know, they're at odds. And one and is it's, evil. It's very tricky because this is like a little bit of it. A lot of this is from you know, religion too, like the bride wears white, you know, <laughs> like the witches and yeah, black. exactly, exactly. Uh, so only non white races are mentioned, uh, you know, for example, so this comes again to white is the default, right? Um, so uh, children at school, two of whom are black or, uh, or uh, in the book, everyone else, every character is assumed white, except when, uh, sorry, if you guys hear this, I got a couple of work text messages coming in, even though I don't oh, know. Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. Um, so basically the writer is mentioning the races of every character, except the whiteness that it just assumes that you as a reader will think, oh, well, everybody, this is a white world and the exceptions will be made. Uh, yeah, and also describing, Describing people of color using food and take this one is they, I get, first of all these are not hard and fast rules these are things for uh, to add awareness for example I'm gonna give you an example of the food one so in salty bittersweet it's a foodie YA rom com my main character describes everything through food and the conversations that she has with her abuela are just you know everything is in it, it's a food language so when her abuela lala is describing isa my main character's uh skin color she says oh you have it's like cafe con leche but yours has a little bit more cafe and mine has a little bit more leche so it's like you know basically um like uh sorry guys i'm like i just get, i turned off my phone but i could get a dis distracting text so, you know, it, it depends on the author on the book. So I, I don't I don't feel like if that comes up in a book, you should just completely dismiss it. Just, just it's, put it into yeah, context. Something to be aware of and to understand that the reason that uh, some, that certain people of color might take offense to it is because it refers to, it's sort of not just, and we'll get to it too, there's like this to fetishize somebody, but also yeah. it relates to food and, and slavery and serving mm -hmm. people. So that's that's where that's where it comes from. So just to just to be aware of it. Okay, so let's look at some other three. Uh, so not doing research on uh, culture or dialect. That's a big one. So trying to use not understanding that Black English or uh, African American vernacular language is a language. It's not bad written English. That that that's you know that's a mistake. So the, these are things that are important uh, to be aware of, uh, making sure that those cultural uh, things in the book are, are, are references are correct. And also keep in mind that even positive stereotypes can have negative effects on readers. So if you know if you have a somebody who is Asian, for instance, and all in all of the books that they're reading, the Asian kid is always the one who's good at math, but maybe that child is mm -hmm. not good at math. Maybe they think, oh, is there something wrong with me because I'm Asian and I should be good at math? I mean, it's it's a st even, any type of stereotype can be can have a negative effect. And it and in some ways you can also say that it's kind of uh, lazy writing because yeah. the writer the re the writer has fallen back on a stereotype instead of actually fully developing the character. And it's, so, it's again when you look at yourself through the single story lens. Stereotypes you have to see them through the single story lens. Like when you when you think about Asians being great at martial arts or math, that is a story that has been told a million times to the point that it has become a stereotype. So that's a do trope. we need to tell yeah. it? Yeah, I mean, do we need to <laughs> do we need another book with an Asian kid who is good at math? Do we really? Or a, or a Native American shaman, un, unless the story is actually being told by its own voices, Native American book. Uh, you know, another uh, stereotype when the black friend or the Latino friend or the Asian friend is only there as a psychic for the main character's plot to advance. That's another thing to look at. And then uh, one that it's, it's, a, it's a 
big uh, thing to look at is the white savior narrative. You know, if there's a white character who's coming into a another community and trying to save the day uh, in spite of the people who are already in the community. So it's what's kind of called the white man's burden. The white person saves the natives because they can't fend for themselves. Right. And what this does is that it infantilizes uh, people of color and gives them no agency. Right. And I see we have some great comments. Speaking of some other amazing authors, Jason Reynolds, Graceland, they're, they are all amazing. And I would definitely look to them for other wisdom. <laughs> it's yeah. probably better than ours. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's talk about 10 ways to check it lit for racism and sexism. Uh, and this is, I love that this is such a um, great checklist. So, for so, and I just want to, I just want to jump in. So I found this, this was actually, this checklist was, was published in 1998 and it was published by the Department of Education in California. And again, it was specifically about race. I think you can switch out a lot of the race um, labels for other labels of diversity, but it's it's still, I think it's still very valid. And it's nice to sometimes have this, especially if you're you're trying to decide, well, what, you know, what is it about this book that makes me uncomfortable? And maybe you're not sure how to phrase that, especially if it's a classic, you can, you can use this checklist to say, well, see here, the Department of Education of California says this. Um, and so these are just some examples. You can start with illustrations, especially for picture books, look for stereotypes and illustrations, look for tokenism, um, and look for active doers. Are the minorities actually the ones um, active in their, are, do they have agency? Are they the ones who are actively pursuing and resolving their own conflicts? Or are they just sort of on the side and you know the, the default character is the one who gets to be the hero? Yeah, and token, I mean, tokenism is a, it's, it's, it's a, one of those little hidden things because you're like, oh, check the box. You know, you have a black kid, you have a Latin kid, yeah. but are they actually doing something? Are they an integral part of the story? Are they, do they actually, do they have agency in the story? It, can somebody see themselves in these characters? And, and just to be clear, these um, diverse characters don't have to be in the book to promote their diverse, you know, their, their piece of diversity. They can just be in the book because they're important characters who also happen to have these diverse characteristics. Yeah. The, yeah, those stories are very important. Um, the race and cultural background, don't, if they're not part of the story, they don't need to be part of the story. It's just the fact that they are being represented. Uh, okay, so let's talk about checking the storyline. So what is the standard for success? Does it take white behavior standards for a minority person to get ahead? You know, it's the resolution of the problems. How are problems presented, conceived, and resolved? Are minority people considered to be the problem? What are the roles of women? Are the achievements of girls and women based on their own initiative and intelligence? Or is it like a James Bond movie that the, the woman is there to be like, I, you know, arm candy type thing? So, you know, we, we got to dive deeper and ask like these uh, more thoughtful questions about what are the roles of uh, the under um, marginalized communities in these books. Oh, thank you, Jennifer, for your beautiful comment. I just saw it. OK, so three, look at the lifestyles that the characters have. Um, you know, are the minority or the diverse characters placed as sort of like a foil to like uplift the default characters who are living life the proper way, uh, which would obviously not be right. Uh, also weigh the relationships among the different people, you know, who possesses power, who makes decisions, who gets to be the leader. These are some, these are, these themes are being repeated. We've, we've talked to, um, about this before, but it's important to internalize it all. Um, and yeah. again, look at who the heroes are. I like the note about the heroes. It's like, does, does the book show only safe minority hero, heroes, those who avoid serious conflict with the white establishment? You know, when we look at books um, like The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas, like that is an anti-establishment book and it was banned in many places. Why was it banned? Because it contained, you know, uh, difficult language because it can contain difficult situations or 
maybe it was because the hero of the story is anti-establishment because they're seeking power within their own community. Like whose interest is a particular hero serving? So these are things that we need to look with a different lens. Mm -hmm. And and if, if we're yes, and and if and maybe our perspective needs to shift a little bit and and look at things from a um from the under uh, marginalized community perspective. How does this book look if I am Latina or if I am Black or Asian? Or if I'm in a wheelchair. Yeah, if I'm in a wheelchair, exactly. So consider the effects on a child's self-image. Does the book counterattack or reinforce this positive association with the color white and negative association with the color black? And this goes for, you know, all the other different types of diversity that we talk yeah, about. Yeah, or, or it's being like a slim body they talk about here. It's like somebody who is not slim, somebody who's obese, do they have to feel like they're not worthy of getting the guy or climbing the mountain or being the superhero? Um, another another anecdote that I had found online was actually written by a, a gender non-binary person who said that when they were growing up and the fact that they never saw somebody like them in a story made them feel that there was something wrong with them. So yeah. before I mentioned the anecdote about the African-American woman who said when she was reading all, always the heroes, the things that the people, the characters that were having interesting things happen to them were always the white characters. So she thought all this good stuff wasn't available to a person of color. But then you, you can also think about the another negative effect. So that's like more lack of active agency. This is a, you know, if the person doesn't see any characters like them, they they might feel that there's something wrong with them. And the, this author went so far as to say that if they had seen somebody like them in a book and they were just in part of the story, like it didn't even have to be about what their conflict was or their struggle, their non-gender binary conflict within them that they were trying to resolve when they were a young child. But even if that were just part, one part of their characteristic and they were going on with the regular storyline, they would have felt better about themselves. They wouldn't have thought that there was something wrong with them. And so that that was a really touching anecdote. And that's also in the, the larger PDF file. Well, you know, it was one of the, the things that I was trying to address in, in Salty Bittersweet is the idea of success and finding success in your own terms. And all of the girls in my book are, you know, Issa, the main character who is half Cuban, half American, half French. And then, you know, um, the other two girls who are in the kitchen with her, Pipa and Lucia, Lucia is, uh, uh, you know, from the south of Spain and Pipa is British, but she's her Jamaican heritage. So for me, it was important to represent all these uh, girls of color who are achieving, you know, these amazing things. And I didn't feel like it was necessary to, uh, you know, to like, I had to have a white girl. I could have a book with, where all the characters, all these characters are diverse and they're from uh, these different backgrounds. And they were all like striving to achieve success in their own terms in this very like male dominated environment. So it was, it's just very empowering when, when you think about it. Yeah, I agree. And, and Janet has a great comment um, touching on the fact that there are also a lot of people out there that don't, identify with only one of these categories. I, yes. I mean, I grow, I'm in New York City now. I have so many friends who are in mixed marriages and their kids are multi-racial, multi-ethnic. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the norm in, in my daughter's friends. It's, it's, really, it's really, I think, so beautiful and wonderful, but that's not really reflected very much in the literature that we're reading even now. Yeah. So that's also yeah. the, the, mul the multicultural, multi-racial, multi-ethnic character mm -hmm. who maybe has difficulty balancing or you know, deals with that sort of struggle, like, well, which category do I belong to? I talk about that a little bit in, in my book because Issa is white and also Cuban and her mother's Cuban and her father is white. And so she she kind of deals with that, which is a little bit reflected in, in my struggle. I'm sorry, I'm staring at my cats who are looking at me forlornly because we locked them in the basement. <laughs> so they wouldn't bother me. And Janet, maybe you should write that book. Maybe that's the book that you write. I yeah, think no, I that think would be awesome. <laughs> I think that that's really important. Although I have to say, one of the sh one of the TV shows which isn't great for kids, but I've been so impressed by the diversity represented in this TV show is Sex Education. It's definitely oh, for high show. schoolers. Yeah. 
I, I want to know what this town is in, in England, this small <laughs> town in England where there is so much diversity, even like there's one of the main characters is in a wheelchair. I think it's so fabulous. I know. Um, okay, so check out the author's perspective. Is the perspective patriarchal or feminist? Is it solely Eurocentric or are the minority cultural uh, perspectives respected? And that is a big thing. It's like these things need to be respected. Uh, so watch for loaded words. So what are loaded words? It's like these backhanded insults um, or words that have um, insulting overtones. For example, savage, primitive, Conniving, lazy, superstitious, treacherous, willy, crafty, inscrutable, docile, and backwards. So are we feeding into the stereotypes? That's the question. Are we are these words feeding into stereotypes? Yeah, and there are even words now like the word crazy, which is often used yeah. to mean silly, but for people who actually have mental illness, it can be very offensive to have somebody labeled as crazy or, or some behavior lab labeled as crazy when what they really mean to say is that's silly. Uh, so that's yeah, something that really nowadays, we're, we're, uh, as writers and as editors, we're, we're trying mm -hmm. to really pay close attention to because we don't want to offend anybody. But And we, got, yeah. we could do a whole presentation on ableist language. That yeah. is a whole other thing that uh, we have to pay also pay attention to. Uh, is there a language that is the meaning um, mental health issues in any way? Right. So uh, another thing is to look at the copyright date. This is so especially important. This is the for, one somebody met, somebody mentioned in the comments. Too. I you gotta know. pull this out and, and show it and be like, with rare exceptions, non-sexist books were not available before the year I was born. 19, 1973. Yeah. So um, somebody mentioned it early. I thought it was really interesting. Uh, and consider literacy, historical, and cultural perspectives. Obviously, we're we're not gonna judge Uncle Tom's Cabin like we're gonna judge, you know, a, like um, yeah, or, the or to kill a mockingbird. Or, you know, yeah. we're all a product. Every single work of art is a product of not only the artist who pr who produces it, but the time period that that artist lived in. That doesn't mean we can excuse everything, but I th I think it's something to be aware of. And part of that is taught very actively in schools. But it's harder to teach that when it's a very young child. Like you can't really do that with a kindergartner. <laughs> yeah, and it's important to put things in perspective. For me, like perspective is 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 so valuable to be able to say, okay, I'm gonna read this book, knowing that this book was written in this time period by this author who was going through these these kind of things, right? And that's that's context that teachers and educators, librarians can provide. So other ways to promote diversity in, in the library, you know, form and accessibility are very important to create collections that also include graphic novels, books in verse, audiobooks, and books in non-English languages, especially uh, especially picture books. Because I, I know, I mean, I know a lot of parents who are bilingual and they love ha being able to um, mm -hmm. read picture books in Spanish for their to their kids. And in the list, in the handout that we included, it does include uh, graphic novels and books and verse in there. Uh, and also having programming to promote diverse, diversity and inclusion, having events and celebrations, develop programs that meet the needs of your community. And this other one is like one of my pet peeves when I go and I walk into a library and all of the art on the walls, like posters promoting books or promoting authors are for white authors. Like, I, I wish there would be a little bit more effort to be in, in um, to have inclusivity in the environment of the library and make sure like the posters also represent your communities and, you know, have diversity in a, in a yeah, and, and some of this authors. might mean that you might want to develop a program that specifically serves us a subset of your of the pop, of a population like maybe you want to develop a program for kids with ADD or for kids um, who are using a wheelchair or have cerebral palsy you don't have to but it's it's something to consider you don't you don't always have to make every single one of your programs accessible to everybody all the time or interesting to everybody all the time because that's impossible there's never going to be one book that the entire world is going to like for instance uh, so sometimes it might be it might be good to just make special programs as well uh, to make sure that those those elements of your audience get feel included. 
Yeah, I mean, and also staffing is, I think, is really important. And we understand that libraries have limited budgets, but there's ways around this and to bring in volunteer staff, maybe to collaborate with some minority um, uh, nonprofits in your area that may be able to volunteer. So have people available to answer questions in another language. If your community, for example, I live in Norcross, Georgia, we have a huge Hispanic community. We also have a ginormous Asian community. So uh, I know when I when I go to the library, it's it's important to have uh, that they have like volunteers and librarians who speak speak other languages because those are the communities that they're serving. Right. So uh, there's there's ways around the budget thing. So we have reached the end of our presentation, but that doesn't mean we can't stay in touch. So please reach out to us uh, via social media. Uh, via our websites, we'd love to answer any questions that you may have or, you know, give you any information. Hopefully the information on the handout uh, and do a quick helpful. Quick plug of your books. Of your book. <laughs> so Salty Bittersweet is a YA foodie rom-com. It has received rave reviews. So I'm super, super, super proud of it. And it features a Latina protagonist and an awesome Cuban abuela. Uh, the little yeah. Graham uh, Lala, <laughs> who's who's a lot of fun. Um, if you have a Title One school or library, please reach out because I have uh, some free copies that I can offer that other people have donated. So just go to my website and um, in the content mix section, send me your information. And as soon as I can get my little butt to the post office, I will ship the book uh, so you have it. And there's uh, it also is misinformation. Well. Yeah, and so my book, This Train is Being Held, has been likened to a retelling of West Side Story. It's New York City urban romance, but both characters are Latinx. So Alex is a Dominican. Um, or his parents are Dominican from Washington Heights. He's a baseball prodigy, but uh, his father wants him to go pro, but he might be—he maybe wants to be a poet. And Issa lives on the Upper East Side, a very fancy part of Manhattan. Her mother's Cuban, her dad is white, she goes to private school and she really wants to be a professional ballerina, but her Cuban mother thinks that's an unacceptable career choice for a modern day woman. And also she doesn't want her daughter dating Latinos. So, and this is, um, I've had some teachers say that they've enjoyed using this as a companion to Romeo and Juliet. The ones where the kids awesome. get to pick, pick I it. I love so. it. Uh, so thank you again for tuning in. Uh, um, Janet mentioned virtual book clubs of Latina and readers from our Title I school. Oh, oh my God, love it. We do virtual we, book we clubs. Can, we can do that. We can tailor it for you. And so my book is for age 13 and up because there is sex in it. It's off page, but it's clear that's what the character's intention is. Myra's, I think, is definitely younger. Like yeah, I'm going to let my I'm going to yeah. let my nine year old read this. My, my nine year old is going to love it. My 12 year old read this in three days. So yeah, so mine mine is, is what uh, the industry term is called clean YA. So there's there's no sex. It's just like one or two kisses, and it's it's pretty clean. I've had eight year olds read my book. Their parents let them read their books, and it'll be fine. And uh, Guadalupe yeah, so asks use, if we can do Zoom. Sure, we can use any platform. We're any even platform. using something called Streamyard this this weekend for a virtual the social distancing book festival. If anybody's interested. Yes. So. We are available. Uh, yes, Chris, thank you for reminding us. Please support your indie bookstores. Um, I do a lot of work with um, Little Shop of Stories here in Decatur. They're amazing. And please reach out if you guys want to. If, if you want to do a virtual book club with us, we would love to do that. Reach out through our websites or uh, through social media. We're here for you. And check out all the amazing work that Las Musas authors are doing go to uh lasmusasbooks.com and just take a look there's so much amazing work there so thank you so much for joining please spread the word about um las musas webinars on social media thank you stay in touch thank you everybody bye, bye.